Hi, my name is Zoe Deschanel. Hi. Well, it's, it's not, but you can call me Zoe Deschanel because I, I love, love this place. If someone approached me in a lift like that, I would be climbing out the hatch because that is proper serial killer behaviour. Or maybe I wouldn't climb out because, you know, serial killers can be hot. If there's one thing I love more than serial killers though, it's the Smiths. And the more music that I listen to, the more I can hear their influence on every band that came after them. Even most of the bands that came before them, because some of their songs are so good it defies the laws of physics and time. The Smiths are the band. And even now in 2024, if most indie bands took a DNA test, at the most distant, the Smiths would be their uncle. At the most distant. Definitely too close to be shagging. So I guess what I'm really saying is, Morrissey is your favourite indie band's drunk, racist uncle. Speaking of which, being a Smiths fan has made me really good at being able to separate the art from the artist from pretty much any time Morrissey has said anything ever. I mean, he's basically become a more right-wing version of Nigel Farage. Uh, still not right-wing enough if you ask me. Cheers. But is he a racist? Well, is a finger a thumb? Sort of, not really, kind of, maybe? At the end of the day, it doesn't affect the music, so you can say what he wants. And if the lights are off, I won't be able to tell if it's a finger or a thumb that's going up my... I mean, he's definitely said some things that are in the same postcode as racism, but I've worked with old people in the past, and when it comes to old people saying racist things, I just, like, yeah, whatever. They're from a different time. Sometimes crosses just set themselves on fire. I've seen it happen. And at the end of the day, there's nothing that he could say or do that would stop me from listening to the Smiths. Even if he killed my entire family in front of me, there are a few of them I could have done without anyway. Before listening to all of these songs for this video, there are about 20 to 25 that I'd never heard. And I was hoping to discover some lost classics from the archives. But I can tell you now, the reason why you haven't heard of songs like Golden Lights and Work is a Four Letter Word is because they're bad songs. So anyway, that's enough rambling. Let's get into the many bangers and many clangers of the Smiths. And their worst song in 72nd place, Meat is Murder. Musical and lyrical highlight for me on this is the cows being slaughtered at the start. Sorry to any vegetarians out there. This whole song is just too on the nose. It's just like Ricky Gervais' comedy without Stephen Merchant. And Morrissey, just, just marinate your Linda McCartney sausages, put something on it. I actually think Morrissey and Mar are a bit like Gervais and Merchant, in the sense that their, their solo stuff has never hit the mark, like when they were combined. And some of their solo stuff is some of the worst things ever put on TV. I mean, seriously, if you've seen Afterlife, it's just three seasons of Ricky Gervais sucking himself off being all the smartest guy in the room. And his stand-up's never been good, but he, the most recent ones are terrible. Ooh, I went on Twitter and someone said, ooh, you're going to hell. And I said, ooh, I don't, I don't believe in hell because I'm an atheist. And he said, ooh, well, I've been to here. <laughs> so good news, Morrissey. You'll never sink as low as Ricky Gervais in my eyes. So feel free to say some more racist things. 71. Work is a four letter word. It's been a while since I read Johnny Marr's autobiography, but in it I'm pretty sure he said one of the reasons that he left the Smiths was because Morrissey wanted to do a lot of Cilla Black covers in the style of this. And fair enough. If this was the direction that they were heading down, maybe it's best that they did end. And since I mentioned Johnny Marr's autobiography, I might as well mention Morrissey's too. He's a good writer, but it's essentially 200 pages of how everyone was mean to him growing up. 200 pages of how everyone's been mean to him since he left the Smiths. And sandwiched in the middle there is about 15 or 20 pages on the Smiths. Like seriously, stop whining and give us the Smiths. That's what we want. You have enough whining in your music. Have you not had one happy moment in your life? You must have seen like an immigrant being deported or someone choking on a chicken wing. You could have, just smile, man. Johnny Marr's book is a bit more meat and potatoes in the writing style, but it's also got a lot more Smith's content. So, you know, they're both fine. I'd read both, but definitely start with Johnny Marr's. Actually, I, I'd, I'd start with Johnny Marr's, then I'd read Morrissey's, and then I'd read Johnny Marr's again as a palate cleanser. After 400 pages of Morrissey whining, you're gonna need something. 70. Golden Lights. Nothing golden about this song, sadly. 
Maybe in the sense it's like a golden shower, but not in a hot way. It's a not great cover of a not great song. So, you know, winning combo right there. And fun fact, that underwater effect on Morrissey's voice near the end, that wasn't added in the studio. That's Johnny Marsh trying to drown him, stop, stop this song from coming out. A good effort, Johnny, good effort. And this song does make me want to drown myself as well. 69, Vicar in a Tutu. The fact that this song is on Queen is Dead makes people scared to slag it off as much as it deserves. But I'm not, I'm not people. I'll slag anything off. David Attenborough, Pedro Pascal, Keanu Reeves, what, what a bunch of clowns. I bet they'd love this song because this is literally clown music. Music for clowns, by clowns, music to soundtrack their clown life while they're clowning around clown town. A decent melody saves this one from being dead last, but if Krusty the Clown ever put out a solo album, which, you know, we all pray he does, it would sound a lot like this. And the Smiths have an, a bit of an undeserved reputation, I think, of being too... When in reality, they're more like, do, 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 do. I don't want to say that this song ruins Queen is Dead. So I won't say it, you can infer it. None of their funny songs have ever really landed for me. It's like they're written by Ricky Gervais. Oh, I, I went on Twitter and, uh, ooh, blah, 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 blah. Did you know he's an atheist, by the way? 68, Miserable Lie. The first half of the song is a bit boring, not too bad. So I, 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 I can forgive boring. But then it gets to the end and Morrissey starts doing this falsetto yodeling, which normally I'm like, okay, I love a yodel, who doesn't? But it just sounds so much like, what does the fox say? Which just ruins the song for me, really. And as a side note, there must be some Smiths fan out there who can explain why the whole first album just sounds terrible, like recording wise. It seriously sounds like it was recorded from another room. Why? 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 67, Rush Home Ruffians. Copy and paste what I said for Vicar in a Tutu. 69. It's just more clown music. I don't know how much clown music is out there in the world, but the Smiths have definitely contributed more than their fair share to it. Definitely above average even more than The Clowns. I love their hit song, uh, Rocking Pneumonia and the Boogie Woogie Flu. Man, that's a banger. They don't make songs like that anymore. 66, Shakespeare's Sister. It's more clown music, but this time it's for the country clowns. Miles away from clown town on the clown farm. I don't know what rhymes with clown that's to do with farms, clown. Clown hoedown, uh, I'll think of something later. 65, you've got everything now. <laughs> Actually, I've only got the suburbs. So that's one point off. Again, it suffers from sounding bad like the rest of their first album. I mean, seriously, Morrissey's vocals sound like he's wearing a face mask while he's recording it. And the song is just, yeah, just boring. I know I just said that I could forgive something being boring, but I've changed my mind. I've grown as a person in these last 30 seconds. I just love to hear some like AI version like high quality remix of their first album. There must be one out there. There's there's one for What's the Story Morning Glory and it just sounds even more clearly like the most overrated album of all time. 64, The Dre's Train. Sure, yeah, there are some good parts on it, but I'm never gonna listen to it. Just like my girlfriend, am I right, fella sweet? Here's my notes up, apology for that joke. Just accept me and after you've done that, accept yourself. It's great to hear Morrissey's morning affirmations. I am sick, I am dull, I am plain. Pretty similar to mine, let's slut it up. But apart from that, it's not too awful. It sounds like a demo version of a better song. So it's all right, it's all right. It's warm on the outside, but it's cold on the inside. Ever heard of this thing called Salmonella Morrissey? I have, that's why I don't go to Itsu anymore. 62, Stretch Out and Wait, a pro abstinence song. And like most pro abstinence things, this doesn't really hold up. There are probably a lot of things that you shouldn't seek Morrissey's advice on, and I think shagging is one of them. 61, I don't owe you anything. Lyrically, is basically the, the Smiths version of Blurred Lines. I know you want it. I know you want it. You're a good girl. 
I know you want it. Obviously, it's not Morrissey's actual views. You know, he's not one to hold controversial views. But the so a song from the point of view of his drunk creep is not something I'm usually in the mood to listen to. 60. Some girls are bigger than others. Sorry, but what the hell is this? The music is so good, like seriously, top shelf material. Good job, lads. But it's absolutely ruined by the lyrics. I mean, it's like it's like speaking to the love of your life on Tinder. Conversations flowing, you've got everything in common. Looks wise, they're the best you've ever had. But then you meet up in real life and they've got the strongest brumming accent ever. Ruined. I've learned the hard way that if their hinge profile has their hometown as Dudley, they're gonna talk like they're from Dudley. Sorry. Dudley, Dudley, oh yeah, I'm from Dudley. The music is great though, and that does save it a lot. But the lyrics, I mean, they're seriously like it's written by a 14 year old. Not even 14, maybe like eight. An eight year old that's just had an unhappy birthday. Hey. Again, the music's pretty good, the melody's pretty good. The lyrics basically turn it into another Smith's parody song. 58, The Hand That Rocks the Cradle. Again, not a, not a terrible song, just. It's a bit of a snooze fest, but I guess that does fit in with the cradle theme. So, you know, fair play. You win this one, Morrissey. I take it all back. You, your Scylla Black covers, they, they were great. I wish you did more of them, to be honest. And I wish you, I wish you spoke your political views more often and also louder and also more right wing. That'd be great. 57, Death at One's Elbow. Again, not a bad song. A little bit of country in there. Always goes down a treat for me. But there's just a little hint too much of clown essence in there. It sort of powers through a little bit. 56. Money changes everything. I don't know why I said it like that, like there's a full stop after every word. Money changes everything. An instrumental. The groove reminds me a lot of How Seen Is Now, which which can only be a good thing. The more something reminds me of How Seen Is Now, the more I like it really. I mean, it's it seriously it probably just a demo of How Seen Is Now that they didn't add lyrics to. That's probably why this song's so high up the list. I mean, it gets secondhand banger status from its association with How Soon Is Now. It's all about who you know. It's not about how good a song is. It's about how well connected it is. This list is just like the, the corporate world. 55, Wonderful Woman. I'm fully neutral on this. Nothing good to say, nothing bad to say, nothing to say. That That's what I want to say. But the real reason is about five minutes ago, I checked another Smith's ranking list. It was by the Rolling Stone. More on that later. Just to double check that I hadn't missed any songs. And I had missed one, and it was this one. And I gave it a quick listen and I thought, yeah, it's fine. I'll stick it about 50. No one will know. 54. These things take time. I mean, I said about the demo version of How Soon Is Now, this is like the demo version of I Want The One I Can't Have. Seriously, even down to the lyrics about getting finger blasted at a train station. Or thumb blasted, you know, depends what time of night it is. Call cool, back to the intro, yeah? So if you ever want to listen to this song, just listen to I Want The One I Can't Have and you'll have a better time. 53, Pretty Girls Make Graves. Is there a Mandela effect here? Because I always thought the song was called Pretty Girls Make Pretty Graves. I don't know. But in any case, Nelson Mandela couldn't have written Pretty Girls Make Graves. But could Morrissey have been elected president of South Africa or prime minister or king, whatever they use? I mean, more likely, definitely more likely. It's, you know, it's decent. It's a mid-tempo head bopper. And it's got a nice little callback to Hand in Glove. So, you know, Nelson would be proud. 52, London. It rocks, it rocks. I like it when they rock out. It's a decent song, but the reason why this is low is because it mentions Euston train station, which if you ever, if you ever got at a train to or from London Euston station, oof, 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 oof. I mean, seriously, I get just I just get flashbacks of being in that main hall bit, looking up at the boards, and then the train, the platform gets announced like one minute before the train leaves, and everyone just runs to the platform. Uh, it's just chaos. I hate. Oh uh, no, 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 no. Even just think about it now, I'm breaking out into a cold sweat. Paddington all the way, baby. Hey, fifty-one. I keep mine hidden. It's actually the final song that they recorded together. Not a classic way to go out, but you know, it's fine. It does sound like they all, they had one more song to do and they're just like, okay, let's just get this over with as quickly as possible so we can all move on. We can all go home, have our Linda McCartney sausages and you know, our apple, Applewoods cheese. 50, 
frankly, Mr. Shankly. Another queen is dead, hot take. But there's a dash of clown in here, again, that holds it back from being a classic. Not too much, just a bit. You know that episode of The Simpsons where Krusty fakes his death and he goes and lives down on the docks in a boat and he's like shaves his head, gets rid of his clown makeup, but you can still tell that it's him. Clown shines through. 49, girl afraid. You go girl. Great groove, solid lyrics about two people who like each other but are too scared to say it. That's what the Smiths are good at. 48, oscillate wildly. Yes, oscillate wildly, the instrumental, because it's actually surprisingly decent. You can really, you can really picture the melody that Morrissey would have sung over this as well. It's weird, I don't know why there's no singing. Thinking about it now, you can see this. The, the title is just Oscar Wilde. Osk elate wildly. Oscar Wilde, Oscar Wilde, Oscar Wilde. Osk me, Osk me, Osk me. 47, Gene. Out of the songs that I hadn't heard before, this is probably the best one. There's a great line in there. I'm not sure what happiness means, but I look in your eyes and I know it's not there. There, good, good, good stuff, good stuff there. The recording quality is not great, but the actual song is, so, you know, who cares? In terms of Gene songs, I'd say Blue Jeans by Lana Del Rey is probably my favourite still. Then Billy Jean. Jean Genie. And then this can be number four. 46, Never Had No One Ever. This song is a bit like having a, a thousand pound gift card for Ferrari. Nice to have, but what can you actually do with that? You know, get some, get some air fresheners. Like you can't buy a car with that. And again, they just have a lot of songs that are better versions of this. So just listen to them. It's pretty much every other song I'm about to talk about. 45, Death of a Disco Dancer. Surprisingly grungy, which I like. And it does make me wonder if they did continue into the 90s, would they have gone down the grunge route? I would have loved that. I did Google to see if Kurt Cobain was a Smiths fan, but I couldn't find anything conclusive. He just said in, a, in an interview that he said about one of the songwriting personalities is tragic visionary, and he name checks Morrissey, Michael Stipe, and Robert Smith. So, you no, know, I don't know if he's a fan, but maybe. He probably bought the best of, maybe louder than bombs. The outro goes on a little bit too long, but when it gets towards the end of the outro and the drums get louder and the new guitar riff comes in, that, that bit is quality. If they cut the first two minutes of the outro out and just went straight to that, yeah, that, that would make this song like 20 places higher. 44, Asleep. Good melody, I oh, know, great melody, but it's just bland. The lyrics are a bit lazy, I think. He, he writes about depression in a lot more interesting ways in his other songs rather than this one. So right, he's he's earned a lazy song. He's He can, you know, spend the day in bed, if you will. 43, Back to the Old House. Another one that I think musically is top tier, grade A, creme de la creme stuff. But again, the lyrics are, are just a bit basic. They're a bit easy, but not in a good way like me on a night out. The first line is, I would rather not go back to the old house. And that's pretty much all you get for the rest of the song. And obviously when I say the lyrics are basic, I mean by Morrissey's standard. These lyrics would still be Muse's deepest lyrics. 42, is it really so strange? Great song, great bloody song. Great song? No, no, good song, good song. It sounds like something that would be played over the, the opening montage of a comedy film of someone moving back and forth between towns. And the song really does tow the line of between clown and not clown. This right on the border of Clown Town. Clown Town City Limits. The lyrics are basically, and I would walk 500 miles. But Morrissey's delivery really does sell that he traveled south, traveled north, killed a horse, killed a nun. His only weakness is a list of crimes. 41, Sheila Take a Bow. Musically and melodically, very similar to Panic. Like very similar, someone should get the lawyers on that. Nothing too deep going on lyrically, but you know, just a nice song. Also, if you listen to Louder Than Bombs in order, you do realise how this sounds exactly like, is it really so strange? I, I seriously thought it's just one long song, a nice long. 40, unlovable. Again, lyrics are a bit on the nose for me, although I do really love the line, I wear black on the outside because black is how I feel on the inside. I mean, that, that's just quality. And more proof that Morrissey invented emo. And also another cracking bass line from Andy Rourke, who I don't think I've mentioned yet in this video, but his bass lines are seriously always Bam, bam, bam. Always highest quality. 
as complex or as simple as they need to be, very melodic, just, you know, the man's genius. What a guy, he was seriously the powerhouse of the Smiths. He was definitely not unlovable. 39, that joke isn't funny anymore. It's like a stripped back version of Last Night I Dreamt Somebody Loved Me. It's just a good song. In the words of Billy Joel, what else do I have to say? 38, Suffer Little Children. Bru it's, bru it's a brutal lesson, this one, but it is hard to imagine that a song about child murders would be anything but brutal. Imagine if they made this a clown song. Like, that would not go down well, I don't think. It does show how well the lyrics and the music match the subject matter. And it is true that Manchester really does have so much to answer for. They gave us two of the things I despise most on this human earth. Oasis and people who listen to Oasis. And at the end of the day, what's worse? Murdering children or listening to Oasis? I mean, mm, mm, no comment, no comment. 37, Half a Person. Nice, this is a good song. This almost a classic. It's just a bit too watered down for me. It's like, you know when you get a cocktail at a bar and they just put all the ice cubes in and after like five minutes when it's melted a bit, you give it a sip and it's just, you know, you spent 15 pounds on a cocktail and you're not even slightly drunk off it. Like, yeah, it's that's not a good way to live. So I call in this song Half a Banger. 36, you just haven't earned it yet, baby. Another good song. I'd say this is a slightly weaker version of Ask, but it's still good, it's still good. Just a little bit too simple to be a classic. You know, this is the, their forest gun. The guy, not the film. 35, nowhere fast. Choo choo. He talks about trains and the drums sound like trains. Genius, all aboard. The music is great. The lyrics are, are great as well, all, mostly. They, they're mostly in the greatness zone. They Especially when he talks about, you know, I'm lying in my bed, I think about life and death, and neither one particularly appeals to me. You know, that's solidly, so that's, that's solidly in the great zone. But then it dropped down a few bits where it says about, you know, dropping your trousers to the queen. I mean, but yeah, for the most part, it's just like a, a cheese that's got a little bit of mold on the corner. Most of it's still great. Just chop out that little corner, eat the whole block. That's what I do. 34, reel around the fountain. The verses and chorus are pretty standard for something off their first album, but the bridge is where this song really takes off. And boy does it take off, like, man it is so good. Then there's the mention of the two lumps, which does make me feel a bit ill, and that knocks it down from great to good. But then I think about it and I'm like, ah, no, that's fine, I can get over that. Back to great. 33, paint a vulgar picture. I love a meta moment. Meta is in fourth wall, not the company. So the mention of you just haven't earned it yet, baby, in this song gets the blood flowing to my extremities in a nice way. I love when songs shout out other songs. There should be more of that. And the lyrics about record labels trying to squeeze every last penny out of an artist. It's like, you know, nice. You tell them, Morrissey. Musically, it does go on a little bit too long, I think. It does get a bit repetitive by the end, but on the whole, it's a great song. And it's got that weird little noise that Morrissey makes at the end. He goes like, me and my true love will never meet again. And then he goes, bah. He sounds like some kind of chicken. And I like my chicken how I like my hooligans. Sweet and tender. An unexpected banger for me. And it's a bit of a rocker, a bit like Rebel Yell. And I wish they had more songs like this. If I had one complaint, I love a complaint, it's that Morrissey says etc. so many times that the word, it doesn't feel like a real word by the end of the song. It loses all meaning. But if that's the price that I have to pay to get a rock Smith song, it's a price I'm very willing to pay. 31, what she said. Yeah, nice, nice. It reminds me a lot of Go With The Flow by Queens of the Stone Age. Or actually this, that song reminds me of this, I guess. I smoke because I'm hoping for an early death. Great line, that line alone. It's just, it's just so emo. It makes me want to dye my hair black put on a black t-shirt, put on a black thong, already got that, don't worry about it. 30, Handsome Devil. The recording quality is a little bit arse, but if you overlook that, the actual song is like a full on arse, like the hand in glove artwork arse. And the term mammary glands is underused in songs, so glad to have that back. We've got a rocking banger that talks about rocking bangers. So game recognized game, 29. I won't share you. A very 
Sweet and Tender, way to close out their last album. More like separate ways, here we come. Am I right? P. I put down my mug, but just imagine I've got it still. Sound very heavenly. If there's like an indie heaven, this is what we'll be playing while everyone's there, avoiding eye contact with each other. 28. Please, please, please let me get what I want. First off, what's up with the weird string version that plays in Ferris Bueller's Day Off? What? What's, the, what's that about? Just play the normal song. But whatever version they use doesn't take away from this song. You know, it's just a nice sweet song. Me likey that. 27. Panic. This song contains what I consider the mantra of the Smiths, if you will. Hang the blessed DJ because the music that they constantly play says nothing to me about my life. If there was a Smiths family crest, they'd have that in Latin. And it's true, it's true. Smith's songs, they're a lot more relevant to my life than most of what's played on the radio. What's played on the radio is about love, relationships, partying. There's none of that in my life. My life's all Vickers in tutus and Scylla Black covers. Plus, any song that was featured in Shaun of the Dead is all right in my books. Although we all know that Hot Fuzz is the best out of the trilogy and there's no debate on that. Thank you. i would be taking no further questions at this time. 26. Shoplifters of the world unite. Damn, damn, damn. That guitar solo is killer. Johnny Marr, you have killed me. As I live and breathe. Another example of me wishing that they went full on rock. I mean, come on, even Dolly Parton put out a rock album. Why couldn't the Smiths? Oh, well. You know, I'm th thinking I might start a Smiths tribute band, but it's cut sort of like set in an alternate timeline where the Smiths stayed together in the 90s and became grunge. And all the songs just sound like heavier versions of this. It's a good idea. I'm sure we'll sell out many an arena. Anyway, stealing is wrong. 25. Well, I wonder. This is what Asleep had the potential to be, I think. A great song about depression. Morrissey just sounds very vulnerable. Gasping, dying, but somehow still alive. This is the final stand of all I am. Damn, 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 that's good. And I love his falsetto throughout this song. Also, also, surprisingly groovy for a song about depression. Largely due to another great bass line from Andy. It makes me want to strut to the edge of a cliff and jump off. 24. Girlfriend in a coma. A nice little jam about a girlfriend in a coma. It's a bit silly, but unlike their other funny songs, this one just works for me. It's because I think it's because the lyrics and the music are really the perfect match for each other. More like a wife in a coma. Am I right? 23. I want the one I can't have. Their best song that mentions getting down and dirty at a train station. And they have a lot of competition for that. Morrissey just loves getting railed. You know the bit where the drums go like... That is pretty much the sole reason that I wake up in the morning. I love that bit so much. 22. What difference does it make? As soon as that guitar starts, you just know it's going to be a banger. And of course it is a banger. A nice banger in the mouth. From Blackstool, I'm charmed, I'm sure. In the dark, it all feels the same, so... So what difference does it make? It makes none. 21. This night has opened my eyes. The dream is gone, but the baby is real. Damn, 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 damn. Remember to use protection, everyone. And if you don't remember to use protection, remember to name your child after me. Zoe Deschanel. It's great storytelling, this song. I wish Morrissey's autobiography was like this. And again, that bass line has once again opened my eyes as to how great a bassist Andy Rourke was. Again, again, again. Great guitars, great vocals. Great lyrics, great song, great bass line, great bass line. 20, Ask. Another upbeat, poppy banger. Very lean, no fat at all on it. It's in, it's out. There's not a second that's wasted. This is what all of their clown songs sound like to Morrissey. But girl please, you wish, I wish, we all wish. Morrissey normally talks about fat girls in his songs, but in this one he moves on to buck teeth girls. So he's growing as a person. 19, a rush and a push and the land is ours. A great way to open strange ways. I don't know what that instrument is. It sounds a bit like a piano, but I don't know. No guitars. You don't need guitars. Sorry, Johnny. You can't sit with us. We don't We don't need you anymore. So it's very unsmithsy musically, but lyrically it is classic Smiths. The song, it just sounds like a graveyard or a cemetery, which has Gates, Bill Gates, born William Henry Gates III. William, it was really nothing. First of all, Great use of the word humdrum. I don't know when we stop saying that, but we need to bring that back. Things haven't been the same since we stopped using it. Another mention of fat girls, he needs to get over it. But again, just another great two minute pop song with no, no wasted seconds. What else do I have to say? And yes, Morrissey, I'd love to marry you. 
Yes, yes, a million times, yes. And also that bass line, oof. Yes, yes, two million times, yes. Also that bass line again. Yes, yes, three million times, yes. And also, uh, that's three is enough, three is enough. 17, stop me if you've heard this one before. I was introduced to this song via the Mark Ronson cover back when I was still in nappies about two years ago. It was a little bit jarring hearing the original for the first time, but it's just so good. It's just so good. If this video hadn't already turned into me just being like, oh yeah, this song's so good already, which it has, it's about to be even more like that. So if you don't want to hear that, just turn off. And what's this song about? No idea really. Falling off your bike and then committing a mass killing. Maybe, maybe, doesn't matter. When a song's this good, it doesn't matter what it's about. It could literally be about cutting your toenails and it would still be a banger, a 10 out of 10 banger. Yeah, I think this is 10 out of 10 song and this is 10 out of 10 and it's number 17. So they've got 16 more 10 out of 10 all time classic bangers to come. So let's see what we got. 16, last night I dreamt somebody loved me. If I made this video in my young years, by which I mean about five months ago when I put out the Arctic Monkeys video, I would have moaned that the intro was too long on this. But now in my old age, I can appreciate the tension that it builds, which all gets released once the song starts. And what a song it is. Uh, this should have been the closer on Strange Ways. I don't know why it wasn't. It's really like an epilogue in the book of their discography. Just wraps, it just wraps up their whole story in a nice little depressing bow, a black bow with skulls and naked men on it. Just like Morrissey, puts on his Christmas presents. 15, still ill. Recording wise, it's from their first album, so it sounds a little bit muddy, but even caked in mud, like it's just got home from a weekend at Glastonbury. The glorious beacon that is this song just shines through. No silic bang required. And it's like a slightly less heavy version of Hand in Glove. It shares a lot of the same DNA. Hand in Glove is still ill's cousin. Again, definitely too close to be shagging. And Morrissey's lyrics are a lot like Sufjan Stevens in the sense that pretty much every line you can interpret as a secret, about being secretly gay. But I think this song is probably the most explicitly like that, up there with Hand in Glove. Also, William is really nothing, it's probably like their, their second cousin, but they, they only sit at Christmas. 14, Rubber Ring. The passing of time really does commit some terrible crimes. I mean, look at how much worse I look now compared to my last video. It also gives Morrissey more chance to say some dodgy stuff. The first guitar bits at the very start did make me think, oh no, it's gonna be a clown song. But then that clown is immediately pushed off a cliff and in comes a certified mind blower classic, Nando's Medium. It's another song that's about loving other songs. Perfect synergy. I love this song. This song loves songs. Just need a song about loving me. So if anyone out there wants to write that, then get on it. I think you should call it that six foot five ripped guy. That, that's how I know it, that it'll be about me. Plus Morrissey's got some nice yodeling in here. So all good, all good. 13, Hand in Glove. Their first single, oh, look how they've grown. Features a naked man on the cover with his ass fully out. Fair enough. I think that's the glove that the hand's gonna be going in, you know. And let's be honest, it is a good ass and it's an even better song. And it's on the heavier side, but it's also got harmonica in there. Suck it, Bob Dylan. And the actual recording sounds a lot better than their, the rest of their first album for some reason. So yeah, bangers all round. Nice round bangers, round juicy bangers. Mm, arse. 12, This Charming Man. Another all time classic, hot sauce, supreme banger song. I just remember reading somewhere that the opening riff was recorded with Johnny Marr dropping knives on his guitar strings. I'd love to know how and why he did that. I have been too clear on what this song was actually about, but from what I understand, it's basically an interpretation of that scene from Superbad where McLovin says, I, I am, am McLovin. McLovin. Except it's Morrissey just saying, I am Oscar Wilde. And as always, the guitar playing gets all the plaudits, but that bass riff, lest we forget, lest we forget, that's a charming bass line. 11, The Headmaster Ritual. If you haven't read Morrissey's autobiography, the lyrics of this song are basically what the first 200 pages are like, except more drawn out and moany. And they don't have the banging music of this. And they don't have the great yodeling of this. I've always had a soft spot for this song because my introduction to the, the deeper cuts of the Smiths was Radiohead's cover of Headmaster Ritual. 
So, as in all of my videos, let's just take a minute's silence to reflect on what Tom York means to us. <coughs> 10. How soon is now? Heavy Smiths. Yes, we love a Heavy Smith song. Some songs are heavier than others, but this is one of the heaviest. This one is so heavy, I'm surprised that Morrissey actually likes it. The intro sounds like a car struggling to turn on. Then the guitars and drums come crashing in. That car is flying. That car is grooving along. It's nearly seven minutes long, but I actually wish it was longer. Like seven minutes and one second. And three hours. And five days long. I don't know the technical term for that wobbly effect that's on the guitar. But it sounds like a drunk guy stumbling out of a club, going home alone, crying and wanting to die. Or as I like to call it, a good Thursday night. The only thing missing is the stop to get chicken and chips. 9. Heaven knows I'm miserable now. This is the Smiths at their Smithsiest. If you put in everything that the Smiths are about into some super AI, you'd get a song like this. It's miserable, but it sounds like heaven. It's just like heaven. I can't believe how true I was looking for a job and then I found a job and heaven knows I'm miserable now is. If only I knew how true that would turn out to be. We never should have left school, man. Yeah, there's no happiness in the real world. Just the Smiths. And boys. With thorns in their side. Wow. Just, it's just genius, this. I said that heaven knows I'm miserable now is Smiths at their Smithsiest, but it's probably this song, actually. It's weird to listen to a song with lyrics this dark, but music so upbeat. Actually, it's not weird. That's like, that's pure Smiths. And also the, the noises Morrissey makes at the end. No, 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 no. That's, yeah, I like that. That's how I imagine him reading negative reviews. I actually think this song's a bit too low. I might move it up a bit. Okay, forget that I put this at number eight. Okay, the real number eight. I know it's over. Listen to this song. I don't actually listen to this song very often because it is too close to home, too near the bone. Don't listen to this song if you're emotionally vulnerable because it might finish you off. I get too emo once it comes on. If, they get, if I get to the third minute of it, I'm already... I start ordering eyeliner off Amazon and booking tattoos. So it's good to skip. Seven, I started something I couldn't finish. Surprisingly heavy, but it's a pleasant surprise. And again, a straight up rock song. What more could a boy ask for? Musically, it's like a darker version of Panic, I think. Panic after dark. And then there's the line, I douse our friendly venture with a hard faced three word gesture, you know. Wow. That's the opposite of absolutely vile. That's, that's relatively vile. Number six, boy with the thorn in his side, for real. Another genius song. Five, big mouth strikes again. Now I know how Joan of Arc felt is a phrase I just love slipping into everyday conversation when I'm even mildly inconvenienced. Not that I have any conversations with anyone, but if I ever did, I would use it. I can't believe that the English actually set fire to her. I mean, we, we used to be a proper country, but just like Joan of Arc, about a minute into her burning, this song is fire, pure fire. It sounds like something that would be played in a film about someone being burned alive. The final scene where their friends try and break them out of jail, but they don't succeed and they burn anyway. It took me a while to get used to the pitched up backing vocals. It did sound a little Alvin and the Chipmunks-esque, but eventually it just all clicked and now now I love them. Call me call me Dave Seville. Am I right? Don't know if I am right. I had to do a lot of deep Googling for that one. So who knows if that's right. Four, Barbarism Begins at Home. I mentioned earlier about the Rolling Stones Smith's discography ranking list. And you won't believe where they had this song placed. The 72nd. I actually called the police and, said, and had them sent to the, the Rolling Stone office because that is, that is criminal. Imagine putting this 70 seconds. Did they even hear that bass line? Yeah, this is Andy Rourke at its finest. I've mentioned a few times how good he is, but prob however many times I mention it, it's not enough. A crack on the head is what you get for not appreciating Andy Rourke enough. And a crack on the head is what you get if you do appreciate Andy Rourke enough. So appreciate him enough. Three, the Queen is dead. Were you sad when the Queen actually died? I wasn't. If anything, I was loving life because I love a bit of Charlie. We uh, Actually, I'm pretty neutral on it. I care so little about the royal family. The news pretty much left my mind as soon as it entered. Unlike this song, which has never left my mind since I first heard it. 
great drums, great guitars, great lyrics, great everything. It's actually so great that it could bring a dead queen back to life. So definitely don't play it too loud. Two, Cemetery Gates. Whenever I watch a film from before like 2010 and I see a dog in it, I just have this moment of sadness when I'm realizing like, oh, that dog is definitely dead now. A very Smithsy sentiment that. But it's also the feeling that I get when I hear the line, with loves and hates and passions just like mine, they were born and then they lived and then they died. This is the band firing on all cylinders and possibly the most upbeat song about the inevitability of death that I've heard. So, you know, good job guys. And now we get to number one, the best Smith song. And it's an easy choice, but it's my list. So I get to choose the rules. Number one, there is a light that never goes out. If Smiths are the band, then this is the song. I mean, there's, I don't know what I can say about this song really. Their best songs have this magic where the music perfectly matches the lyrics. And the music of this song sounds like being so happy that you want to die in a bus crash. And luckily that's what the lyrics are about. I haven't seen Morrissey live, but I have seen Johnny Marr. And even though he's not the best singer in the world, when it comes to this song, it didn't matter because all you could hear was the crowd singing it. So forget Mr. Brightside, forget Bohemian Rhapsody, definitely forget Wonderwall. This should be our national anthem. And the ultimate sign of this song's quality is that not even James Corden singing it can ruin it for me. That's how good it is. So there you go. Every Smith song ranked worst to best. Thank you for watching. I think it's crazy that they were together for such a small period of time. They must have the most bangers per annum of any band ever. Also probably the most clangers per annum as well. Next video is going to be about a more modern artist. Only two albums. So hopefully I should have it done in less than six months. Maybe five and a half. So yeah, see you later.